Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed your breakout lunches and also the creative sessions. I certainly went to a, a really terrific one, and I hope all of yours were just as good. Um, we're going to switch gears slightly here uh, for our next plenary session uh, to talk about giving ground, why inclusive and sustainable cities matter. And to introduce this session, we're really delighted to have with us uh, a great friend of GMF, uh, Janet Lampkin, President, Bank of America, California. Janet, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. My Thank pleasure. you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's so terrific to be here. And I, as you, I sure, I'm sure, am really looking forward to our panelists this afternoon who are going to talk about this issue of inclusive and sustainable cities. It's an issue that I've been involved in for some time and very recently had led a conversation in Bilbao on this topic. And that was really circled around the title was Innovation, Disruption, and Creative Solutions for Cities. And there was a quote from that session that I'd like to share with you all today. And it is, every act of creation starts with an act of destruction. I'm from the Silicon Valley, been there for 25 years. So as you might think, that would probably be a quote from one of the CEOs of Facebook or Twitter. It's all about disruption in Silicon Valley right now. Well, interestingly, that quote is from Pablo Picasso. And I found it really interesting that that notion of destruction is fairly timeless. As I said, any time you go to coffee or lunch in Silicon Valley these days and you talk with a tech executive, it's all about disruption, how to disrupt an industry. Industries are disrupted when they don't let go of the old ways, when they don't stop and recognize what consumers and customers and citizens need and want. If you think about it, music, books, newspapers, those are all disrupted industries. Many players are gone or have reinvented themselves, like Netflix. They were able to figure out where the consumer wanted to be, and they left the old tried and true approach, and they went to that notion. So I think this whole concept of destruction in terms of driving transformational change is really important and relevant for cities today. There's another common concept in Silicon Valley right now, and that is the shared economy. Some examples that you might be familiar with are the companies Airbnb or Uber. It's the whole notion of new partnerships that are designed around mutually beneficial arrangements. If you want to rent an apartment in San Francisco these days, you don't go to Craigslist. You go directly to Airbnb. You connect directly with the supplier. It's a new partnership, more efficient, different outcome. That's another concept that I think can be applied to cities. And let me give you a little bit of example around the new partnership. Obviously, uh, I reference Silicon Valley a lot. It's been home for 25 years. There's a lot of other tech and innovative areas, but I'm most familiar with it. And I think Silicon Valley was an early adopter of both of these concepts. The concept of disruption for efficiency, shared economy, new partnerships. If you talk to many of the com company execs at Google or Facebook, they believe that the reason they are successful today and they're thriving today is because a really unique partnership occurred several years ago, 25 years ago. Government, business, and the nonprofit community collectively built an ecosystem in that region that seeded and funded these companies, that nurtured them, that counseled them, that allowed them to fail and then grow. And they attribute their success to that ecosystem, that set of new partnerships. So the Bay Area benefited from that ecosystem. And as that growth has taken place, it's also challenged by that. There's, because of that growth, as you can imagine, there are housing challenges, transportation challenges. Well, the good news is that e ecosystem is in place to deal with those as well. There is a recent project in San Francisco that pulled together t the tech industry executives, the mayor's office of San Francisco, and nonprofits to ensure that the San Francisco so school system has the right training skills for jobs, not for today, but for tomorrow. Coders, and coders that will get jobs. So that ecosystem has really benefited that city. The notion of new partnerships is one that I'm also familiar with, new and unusual partnerships. I wanted to just share 
two of them with you. First of all, as you know, I'm with Bank of America, and we recently partnered with Red and donated $10 million to the eradication of AIDS in our lifetime. I don't think there's a more unusual partnership than a global financial firm and a very hip rock band from Ireland, but it came together because Red and the executives in Bono understood that our company reaches one out of two Americans, and that scale and that visibility was something they needed. So we brought together this fairly unique partnership. A second one is a very local one, near and dear to my heart, that, engages, that involves one of our panelists today. When Antonio Villaraigosa was mayor of Los Angeles, there was a wonderful project in Los Angeles centered around the iconic organization, the Getty. And it designed a Pacific Standard Time exhibition, which seated different small organizations, museums in Southern California to bring Southern California art back. It benefited 70 different galleries, the entire Southern California region, featuring California art in one time frame. It was an international exhibition. It was designed to drive cultural awareness and education, and it was a real lift for each of those museums. And we know how effective that partnership was between the mayor's office, who really provide the infrastructure and the leadership on it, the Getty, and Bank of America. That partnership, we measured the outcome. That exhibition created jobs in Southern California and drove over 300 million in economic development. So it was a wonderful, unique partnership with different and sometimes unusual players to bring together a solution. So as we think about how cities can be inclusive and can be sustainable, I think it's obvious those are complex issues. We need these complex partnerships, and I think we'll get into that today. Before we turn over to the panel, let me just um, leave you with one final thought from an American composer, John Cage. He says, I can't understand why people are frightened of new ideas. I'm frightened of old ones. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the editor of Monocle, Mr. Andrew Tuck. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think everybody knows the format, and we're not going to shake it up here. We're going to begin with a, a very short video, and then we'll be introducing the members of the panel with a couple of questions from me. But the success of this session is going to be down to you, so make sure you have plenty of questions because I think we're going to be covering some really hot topics for all cities at the moment. In June 2014, GMF convened the Bilbao Urban Innovation and Leadership Dialogues to explore concrete strategies for developing sustainable and inclusive cities. By bringing this theme to Atlantic Dialogues, GMF seeks to expand the conversation to the wider Atlantic and reinforce the critical importance of an urban agenda that focuses as much on inclusive growth and shared prosperity as on sustainable development. What actions are local leaders taking to address the inequality of opportunity and encourage more inclusive growth? Are national governments and global institutions paying attention to local policy innovations? How are cities balancing bold vision and strategic partnerships with public participation and transparency. What are the risks if a sustainable and inclusive urban agenda is not a top priority for city leaders? Well, there's obviously some very good questions there. I'd just like to add a few to that list before we start. Uh, what happens if you don't have an inclusive bus service that people think they can afford? Well, you can call the mayor of Rio and you can ask him. Yeah. What happens if you have a city where nobody can afford any more to buy a property because the property in that city has become a deposit for the money from Qatar, from Uzbekistan, come to my city, London, and see a generation of people who are in, 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 in employment, who have good jobs, who literally have nowhere to live in the city? What happens even in, you know, we heard from Janet a great story about what's happening in Silicon Valley, but what happens when even people in San Francisco think, do you know what, this new tech generation is just another generation of wealthy people, 
and they start throwing bricks at the Google bus. These stories of inclusion are so important because unless we get them right, all of us face huge challenges around how our cities are run. So those are questions I'm hoping to kind of tease out from the panel. And I'll start with you, Mayor. Uh, you sit in a city, which I'd like you to explain a little bit, a riddle about your city. You're from Moroccan descent. Your family moved there in the 70s. But Rotterdam is also the home of Pim Fortune, of the far-right movement of the Netherlands. How come these two unusual stories have come about? You know, Mr. Fortin um, told me once when I was leading a political debate in the uh, press center in The Hague, it was really a long time ago, and said to me when we finished the, the debate, the moment a Muslim become a minister in this country, I will move. <laughs> And it was the first one. <laughs> and then, finally, he has, has been assassinated. And in the city where he founded his first political movement, I became the mayor. So it's fascinating how history can, can turn. I think um, 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 I'm leading a city with 174 nationalities. One, seven, four. Uh, so I am a small Ban Ki-moon. <laughs> 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 and keeping that together is a huge task. And I'm not doing that by uh, preaching harmony, but I'm really tough on my citizens because I require something from them. And, um, but also preach that peace and stability is really important. And I simply cannot accept that I get a city of 174 speeds. So an integrated community, leaded by one mayor, forward towards a better future, is really important. That's why when I became mayor in 2009, I said to my city council, whatever the politics here is, but to me as mayor, I will never allow somebody to sleep on the streets. In my city, nobody sleeps on the street. Either it's an asylum seeker, or it's an illegal immigrant, whatever, but in my city, Nobody sleeps on the streets. You know, with this variety of political parties, to far left, to far right, there was an applaud for this idea in the city council because my citizens will be happy to be a city that is not divided by um, culture or religion, but to be bounded in one thing, that will believe in a common future. We're going to be looking at how all sorts of institutions work together to get things done. Uh, and there's no better person to ask than Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie has sat on every side of the fence, if there's more than two sides. I think on men multiple sides of multiple arguments. She now finds herself running a huge part of the Ford Foundation. You've been in government. You've done sleeves rolled up, grassroots work. To get things done, where do you find that easiest? Do you find it easier in the role you are now, where you don't have to answer to an electorate, and when you're not a corporate player either, you're not having to answer in the end of the day, does this make a profit? It's never easy. But I think that you have to be listening, paying attention to where opportunities are moving to and where um, there's resources and an audience and traffic that is willing to work together. I think it takes multiple sectors and it takes an interdisciplinary approach to working together. And sometimes governments and private sector, uh, civil society are willing to do this and sometimes the times um, make them be more complacent. I think um, that's one of the reasons why I went to work for the Obama administration in 2009 because of the global recession. I think um, all of these sectors and people on the streets were willing to look at um, things that they had been, done, been doing in same old thinking um, in new ways, and that was an opportunity. Just before we move on, it's, it's interesting, all the discussions we hear, when you hear people coming from academia, whether they're from a think tank, whether they're from business, 
you guess they're all talking about the same thing, but even the language is kind of different about how they address these things. When you're trying to join those dots up, is that one of the challenges, trying to find a common language that the people coming from the corporate world, from government, from think tanks can all kind of agree on? You're not going to get a common language. I think we're all going to stick to our language very dearly. Um, but at least an understanding as to the common agendas, and we talked about it yesterday, so all these circles, and where's that sliver in the middle of that Venn diagram where I understand, I'll call it something different, but I understand what you're trying to do and how you're trying to do it. I may not agree with it, and I think that um, that's one of the issues. Uh, for example, the Ford Foundation has been funding for the past 50 years the profession of planners. We've also been funding advocacy organizations, the same organization funding these two, what's now silos, tables of people that really want the same goal, a community, a city that works for its residents, but um, not coming together um, and actually being very adversarial. So how do you build that table in a different way? It's not going to have the same language, but you s jump to the, the final go outcome. Antonio, we've heard a snapshot there of what it's like running Rotterdam. Some of the challenges, you ran Los Angeles for many years. That sense of inclusion, now, let's be naive and let's ask you the questions from the outside. When we look from Europe at Los Angeles, we see in many American cities, we think a city that is divided very clearly between the haves and the have-nots, between communi communities that are still segregated by race and background. Is that true? Is that changing? And how much of a challenge was that for you on a day-to-day -day basis in Los Angeles? First of all, I want to thank our host, uh, the Atlantic Dialogues. Uh, there are two centers here who have come together and invited us. It's an honor to be here and mm -hmm. to be here with friends and uh, esteemed colleagues. Uh, secondly, let me just say, uh, I think it is uh, important uh, that city leaders, and particularly uh, global cities, are invited to events like this. Because so much of what happens, uh, at least successfully, around the world is generated uh, by cities and, and particularly uh, large metropolitan global cities. Um, with respect to, to this notion of what people from the outside look at LA as, I'd say this. LA is constantly changing uh, in many ways. Uh, this was a city that when I grew up, it was a city founded, as you all know, by Mexican settlers a city that changed over time. Uh, they were never dominant in their numbers be after about uh, 1870 or so. Uh, when I was born, it was a city roughly 9% uh, of the population was Latino. Today, nearly 50% is Latino, primarily of Mexican descent. 67% of the city, uh, two-thirds, come from Latin America, Asia, and Africa. We don't have as many different nationalities, but we have a larger percentage of them, about 144 countries, a larger percentage of them that are a part of the city. So the notion, though, that LA is this stratified city, I would say this. No more stratified uh, than New York or Chicago or Houston or Miami. Um, certainly a city that struggles uh, as much of America does with the haves and the have-nots, mm -hmm. uh, and as mayor, I focused a lot uh, on the investments that I thought were important uh, to change that. So it began with education. Uh, I didn't have uh, oversight over the schools, uh, but I tried through the legislature to have that because about 40% of our kids were graduating from urban schools, and today about 70% are graduating, in no small part because we made that issue critical. Nothing to brag home to mom about. It should be 100% and they should be going to college or getting a job skill. But we focused a lot on that. We focused on uh, public safety uh, as well because crime happens primarily in the areas, the poor areas. Mm -hmm. uh, we halved uh, the, um, the crime rate, the violent crime rate. LA and New York now are the two safest big cities in America. Not as safe is Rotterdam or cities like that, but certainly more safe than we were 20 and 30 but, years ago. But was ago. that question of inclusion, is that 
the top of the list for you on yes. a day-to-day -day basis? It was me, in no small part because I came from the other side of the tracks, uh, because I grew up poor, <laughs> because I understood, as I've said many times, sure. that the role of the first is not to pound on your chest and say how great I am. The role of the first is, uh, is to open up the door for the rest. So I did focus a lot on that. Um, I'm not saying that everybody uh, before me or afterwards uh, maybe <laughs> focused on it the way that I did, but I certainly understood how important it was to our city. Let's bring um, you back in, Mr. Mayor. We spoke earlier and you said something that I found interesting and a little bit surprising. We when, Often when we sit here in Europe or in Africa and we think about the job of inclusion in cities, maybe being kind of a little bit kind of too liberal sometimes, we think of it as a one-way journey. We think that the people who sit in those European cities aren't doing enough to adapt to the migrant communities. But you threw the challenge back. You said you can't have two loyalties, and at some point you need to transfer your loyalty. Could you explain how that that, that cog of inclusion works for you? Well, just the most recent um, example of that statement was when I was writing an article about the ISIL and the development in the Middle East, saying to those people with full knowledge, adult people, 40, 50 years old, um, staying with the back to the Dutch society, in fact, to the West, and they argue, this is not the place for me to be. I feel more loyal to you with ISIL and with the Islamic movement in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Well, to me, it's very easy. That's not the, the, the segment of the former Dutch government, but it doesn't dare me. I say to these people, come to me, deliver that Dutch passport that I get from me because I'm giving the passport to these guys. Give that passport back, move. If you make another choice, you don't will be part of our society. You feel more loyalty to the other part of the world it's free choice, move. The only one I have to protect are the youngsters under the age of 18. The most important thing an immigrant can do when they go to another country, another culture, is to make a mental choice. Do I want to be part of this society? Do I want to be part of this culture? Do I want to, do I want, do I want to carry the history of this country with me? I'm not responsible for the history, but do I not accept it as part of my life? You cannot stay living that way. One leg in this country and the other one in the other, in the other culture. Nobody mm -hmm. can survive that. So make a mental choice, knowing that all immigrants start from the very zero, from scratch, building up their own future. And yes, they pay sacrifices. So did I, my father, and all, all the other immigrants, they did. The former people go to Los Angeles. They, they sacrificed too. Mm -hmm. but. That pays at the end. My father, who was, um, I was happy yesterday um, in my role as mayor to marry my sister. <laughs> um, so he had two, three personalities in his front. His daughter, uh, a doctor, his oldest son, a mayor, and the other, the other one, a CFO of Shell in the Middle East. Um, but he started from zero, and his life is still zero. But he sacrificed for us because he made the, the choice, this is my country. And I think it's really important um, to have that. That's why when I say that I'm, I'm tough for the immigrants myself because I want to tell them this story. Um, grab all the chances you can get in a society and try to be part of it. On the other hand, you can never merge into traffic if nobody allows you to merge. Mm -hmm. So this majority society must make space in a reasonable way. So to me as mayor, I don't have one message. I have a lot of messages, the one for this group and the other one for the other group. And it's important to create a sentiment of understanding of each other, not necessarily to become friends, but at least to understand each other. I want to ask people about some concrete examples of their work so we, get, we really get to understand what they do on a day-to-day -day basis so we can quiz them even better later on. But just before we do that, Again, we had a conversation last night, and you were saying you come from a background of migrants as well. You're Cuban-American, you're Puerto Rican-American. Just quickly, before I quiz you on the concrete examples, how do you feel about that notion of a two-way deal between the migrant and the community that they move to? 
I agree and I disagree. Yes, we all come to this country or whatever country you're coming to with nothing. In our case, we just came with one duffel bag. Um, but we had, what we, we had an education, so we had a head start because even though you have nothing, at least nobody can take away what's in your, in your head, in your mind, your education. And so that gives you a big um, advantage. Uh, even if you have nothing else. So, and there's a lot of institutional barriers that in many systems, in many communities, that you don't see and you can't really put your finger on, um, but they're there. And um, actually, it was in the US, some people think that it was possibly easier uh, when things were much more obvious, because at least then you could litigate. Nowadays, you can't really just sort of have a feeling that something's wrong, but you can't um, pinpoint it, and that's much harder. So. Okay, I'm, we're going to completely jump track now because there's so many points to get in. I want to ask about the work that the foundation does and the projects you get involved in. I know you've done a lot of work in Latin America, and a really good project you've been working on is in Colombia. Yeah where there was a decision made to build a highway, old school urbanism, build a highway right through the center of a city. You were pulled in actually by the mayor. Explain to us, so first of all, I, I presume that people, not everybody realizes how much work you do outside of the US. Latin America is a big, big space for you. Just tell us a little bit about the project and how, in a sense of inclusion, you kind of managed to help nudge that decision in a new direction. Sure. And that's right. The foundation has its headquarters in New York, but we work. We have offices in ten countries. And just quickly, how much money does the foundation have in the bank? Thirteen billion. Okay. We're very small. Compared Million or billion? Billion. Billion. Good. Small compared to Gates. It's um, not too bad. Yeah, but uh, we got pulled into Cali in particular because Mayor Guerrero, who's an epidemiologist. Um, had been looking at the system of systems in the city of Cali, and his predecessor in the city council had actually voted to make this 19-mile, what used to be a rail, um, rail line that um, really bifurcated the city into the east, uh, which is the very poor part of the city, and the west, which is very um, where all the jobs are, and make that in an effort to improve traffic. Um, into a superhighway. This is in a city where there's so much, uh, a large percentage of its commuters um, get to work by, uh, by cycling, bicycle. And um, the mayor, when he came on board, said this is just going to permanently bifurcate the city and deepen inequalities in a way that we will, it'll lock us in and we will never get back to um, weaving our social fabric together. So um, he brought us in to think about how we, they could do uh, value capture of the land on, uh, you know, on both sides. And now what's happening is it's going to be converted into 19 kilometers of uh, a green space, a linear park where it'll be BRT, bus rapid transit, um, which has not existed in, in Cali before, and uh, walking and cycling paths. They're going to be putting, uh, where it's, it's pretty much abandoned space right now, they're going to be putting uh, retail in with the land from that, then they're going to be putting housing, and we hope it'll be the first experiment in mixed use, mixed income, and some rental um, typologies of housing, which has, is very infrequent in Latin America. So it's very exciting because it promises to be the potential to be a pilot that can be looked at in other places and maybe inspire some other work. Now, I like best practices, so I just say inspire. <laughs> we'll come look. Uh, we're going to try now and cut to, there is a, a fourth invisible guest here who's uh, sitting in South Africa who was unable to get here today, who we really want to draw now into the conversation. So I think via Skype, I'm told, where will we, will we see this? Oh, is it going to pop up? Uh, but this is uh, Belelwa Gowana, who's okay. the Chief Executive Officer of the Cape Town Partnership. And there we have you. Welcome to the conversation. Um, I wanted to ask you first, we're talking here about the role of inclusion, how this works in different societies and different cultures. South Africa always seems to us a very special case. You've been post-apartheid now for 20 years. 
And the moment apartheid ended, I think that people in South Africa and especially felt the government would be able to write a check and right wrongs at the same time. It would build the housing. It would, it would solve the health care problem. 20 years later, we know that hasn't happened. Do you think it's time to look for a new range of alliances in South Africa to begin to come good on those stories? Um, yes, Andrew, that is exactly the case. I mean, 20, in 2014 in South Africa is a very special year as it marks uh, uh, two decades of democracy. We've now gone over the euphoria of freedom and reality has really sunk in. The gap between the haves and have-nots has grown marginally bigger than we ever thought it could be. And there is a growing population that is, hasn't seen um, or has no hope of ever being able to be employable. Um, and that is causing a huge amount of angst amongst the society. So what is really needed now is what we call collaborative partnerships, which is a, a, an ability to be able to bring the public, the public sector, the private sector, and the civic society together to be able to collaborate and co-create co solutions for the pro problems that are facing current society at the moment. So the work of the Cape Town Partnership does exactly that. It bridges that gap. We put the citizens in the middle and try and bring these uh, three sectors together to try and find a collaborative, uh, practical solution based on very hyper-local interventions, which are aimed at adding a, a value to current projects that are being driven by government. And Bilal, it's fascinating because I understand that you have a very kind of unique method of making this work. So Bilal sometimes brings people together, the, the, the civic leaders, the people on the ground, the, the government, the designers who need to fix these solutions. So they came up with, a, they realized that they had a problem with sanitation. Explain to me your, uh, your 36 hours rule. Right, well, the sanitation is one of those issues that really becomes hyper-political when they're discussed. It becomes extremely conflictual. So what we did, we came up with a platform we called Design Storming. It is a, 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 an inclusive and participatory design process which is focusing on addressing issues of social significance. In this case, it was sanitation, where you bring together the beneficiaries, which are which is the community, and you bring together designers, which are the guys who are able to see, uh, uh, to bring in design thinking in terms of the solution. You bring in the implementers, which is government. You put together uh, them together in a room for 36 hours, and through that 36 hour process, they storm through those hours looking at the problem, trying to find solution, refining the problem, so that all three parties become co-collaborators in creating, in, first in, in owning the problem and in creating the solution. What comes out of that pro process is an open source um, a product that can then be implemented by government or an agency that is appropriate and can, replicate, can be replicated at a city-wide level. So we've done this now with sanitation, we've done it with uh, early, child, early childhood, and we've also looked at waste management. Well, well, thank you very much. Don't go away, because there's going to be questions, I'm sure, for you from the floor. Antonio, we were going, talking about concrete examples. One of the great things that happened in Los Angeles in recent years is uh, a belief again in public transport, in building subways, in connecting communities. Is this, of course, it's good for people to get around a city, but how does this chime with the story of inclusion? Well, when you think of sprawl, and the urban planners in the room know that uh, LA is the quintessential city of sprawl. It's where it all began. Uh, we have the job, the housing in the outer perimeter. And when I say outer perimeter, I mean 60, 90, even 120 miles away. And the jobs in the inner core downtown and in the central core. And one of the things I said uh, when I became mayor was that we were going to have to rethink what LA looks like, uh, that we were going to have to uh, build uh, more density. Uh, I called it elegant density uh, because there was a great deal of opposition to this notion of density because people saw density, traffic, crime, poor people, uh, you know, as you mentioned, um, so uh, we basically came up with this notion that 
if we were to invest in public transportation, we could create a more livable city, a denser city, a city where poor and middle class people live together. Um, and uh, I put together uh, a measure on the ballot, $40 billion dollars over 30 years to double the size of the rail system. And yes, it was connected to this issue of have-nots. My mother rode a bus her whole life. Uh, she didn't own a car for most of that time. Most of the poor in LA ride a bus. The buses used to be very overcrowded. We changed that. Uh, they used to be polluters. Now every single bus is uh, a, a clean fuel bus. And then we said, we ought to have more in the way of rail and subways for them as well. So yes, it was focused on them, but particularly on bringing more people to the city center uh, where the innovation occurs, where the creativity is, and where the livability can be greater when people have uh, the infrastructure investments that allow for that. Public transportation, affordable housing, jobs close to where they work. I'm going to throw it open to the floor in just one second, but just before we do that, what did you think about Belawa's idea of giving people 36 hours to kind of come to a solution? I'm sorry. What did you think of Belawa's idea of giving people, actually, sit down, some of these solutions are not so complicated, they're so politicized, sit down, 36 hours, come up with a solution. Were there times that you wished you could have done that in Los Angeles? Mm -hmm. Many times. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, this notion of more transparency, of more inclusion, of a broader cross-section of stakeholders, of accelerating the time between the idea and the fruition of that idea are critical. Uh, unfortunately, we've come to the point in the country, um, and I, I like to say that politics has broken, I think, more on the right. I am a Democrat, but also on the left. We've come to a point where you can't build anything anymore uh, you know, particularly light rail or subways or bridges or roads and not take a minimum of 10 years. Uh, and while you have, uh, you know, the, the inclusion of stakeholders, it's usually the same ones, uh, the ones who are strongest about their opinions. And so, the, well, I do agree we need to amplify and spread out the stakeholder participation. S some people have too much uh, in the way of, of input um, and not enough responsibility for output. So we've heard here from Ahmed, the, the mayor of Rotterdam, the dual responsibility of migrant and city. Anna Marie has kind of highlighted some of the roles of philanthropy, its abilities to sometimes act more adeptly and quicker than, say, government players. Antonio has given us great examples of how transport, all sorts of things, can change the discussion around inclusion. And Balelwa has given us an example again. Time maybe for South Africans to rethink what their contract is with their government and start thinking, actually, we can't wait any longer. The government is not going to be able to do this. We need to change how inclusion works. It needs to come from the bottom up as well as waiting for people in authority. So I think lots of good, meaty, controversial subjects here for us to jump into. A raise of hands, and I th think there's a microphone. The, the gentleman here, please. Could you just say your name and uh, tell us where you're from? Thanks. Uh, Justin Guest. I'm from Los Angeles, California. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I live in Washington, D.C. Constituent. <laughs> well, not anymore. I can't vote there. But uh, I moved to Washington, D.C., where I'm a professor at George Mason. And your question for the panel. My question um, is, in reflection of government ineptitude at the national level, the federal level, sometimes at the international level, um, but also because of different sentiments amongst voters at the local level from uh, in urban places rather than rural places, we've seen local governments taking action on issues that they previously were not supposed to take action on or didn't take action on. Uh, in the United States, it's immigration and it's sometimes trade, it's, it's, it's things that usually you would expect the, the federal government to worry about, and yet cities are taking action more. I wonder if, the, if Mayor Abu Talib and also Mayor Villaraigosa would answer the question of where do we draw the line? Is it worth challenging federal rules to, in order to get cities to take action instead? So let's try and keep the answers reasonably snappy because I've got a feeling we've got a lot of things to get through. 
would you like, would you like to start? Mayor uh, Abu Talib, um, I have the habit never to answer the city council that if they have a request with the, uh, with the answer, that's not my duty. I would never say that. Uh, whatever the question is raised in the city or by the city council, it's my duty, even if it's not in the judicial system. Sometimes I create facts on the ground and go to the judicial system in the Hague national government and say, fix it. Um, that's, I think, the way we deal with that in Rotterdam. Um, I was telling you about that I don't allow people to sleep on the street. That is not the official policy of the Dutch government. The Dutch government sometimes does not succeed in putting people out of the country. They put them simply on my sidewalk, and then it becomes my issue. And I say, well, if you can't send them back, I don't allow them to sleep under the bridge. It's not on the, um, um, the, within, within the law, it's um, really outside the law. Uh, so it's about taking the initiatives. A lot of uh, initiatives to legislation are taken in my room. Sometimes we write part of the law in the city and deliver it to the parliament and say, please deal with it the way we would like you to do that. Um, and we think nowadays with the government, the whole issue of terrorism. If it happens, it will not happen in the backyard somewhere in the countryside. It will happen in Amsterdam or in my city. Mm -hmm. So it's reasonable that the government is involving me and my colleague in Amsterdam in dialogues about how to deal with that issue, how to tackle it, how to prevent it, how to detect it. So it's really a, a kind of a cooperation between the Dutch um, national system and the big cities to make um, 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 uh, a common policy. And we have a tradition in that. And sometimes really cities force that the national government and the parliament are dealing with issues which were not there an, um, um, a week ago. As soon as we put them on the table and we communicate them as so urgent, there will be debate about that in Parliament, and then it becomes an issue for the government. And, the, and a perspective from Justin's home city, Los Angeles? Yeah, I, I'd say a number of areas, but you wanna, I want to keep it short, so I'll, I'll say two. One is immigration. Uh, we see uh, LA uh, as benefiting from its diversity and from Im immigration. So as an example, uh, we led the fight for, to provide driver's licenses for the undocumented, led the fight uh, to not cooperate with the federal government when they would arrest people uh, simply because they were there illegally and, and deport them. And we said, no, uh, these people have children here, they're working here, they're bringing value here. We embrace them. Uh, we, uh, on the issue of uh, trade, uh, tourism, and foreign direct investment, you know, geopolitically in the United States, there's this notion that China is a threat. Um, and it has a lot to do, frankly, with the jostling between the two parties and the leaders in that party. Uh, LA, Chicago, New York, uh, we uh, don't focus on those geopolitical issues. We're focused on trade, tourism, foreign direct investment with China, and the rest of the world. So there are many areas, and I could name more, where LA, Chicago, New York, big cities particularly, and j just so you understand what drives the economy, those three metropolitan areas, LA, New York, and Chicago, uh, have a economy the size of France. The top 10 uh, eco metropolitan economies, a $5 trillion economy. So we're focused, we have different um, priorities than the national government. And the last area is sustainability, which I won't speak on, and I hope we're going to get to, because that's what this was about. I, and I do want to talk about the way we took on the federal government on the issue of Kyoto, but we'll get to that afterwards. I'm particularly looking for a question that will bring in the, the notion of uh, philanthropy, just so that we can make sure that uh, all of our panel are included in the conversation. Uh, the gentleman here, could we get the microphone here, please? Working for a Kenyan research organization in a Belgian city in Brussels. I have three questions. The first one has to do with politics. Cities are created by their inhabitants, and yet, as far as I know, around the world, there's far less participation in municipal elections than there are in national elections. We have seen, in the case of the Scottish independence referendum, how people can get excited when the political question becomes serious. What can we do to get that happening in our cities? The second question has to be about the integration of minorities, religious minorities and ethnic minorities. My adopted city of Brussels is I would venture doing an extremely bad job of it, and we are seeing an increase in the vicious circle between extremism on the one hand and rejection on the other hand. 
And my third question, to which you may not have an answer since none of you come from an African city, has to do with what do you do when you're managing a city of farmers, which is what most African cities are. Most African cities have people who are actually farmers. Their families are still in the villages, they're still running the fields, but they have come, they live in the slums, they're trying to do a little bit of a job in order to get a little bit of money. So those are my three questions. Thank I think, you. I think that's very sneaky. It's very sneaky getting in three questions in one go. Can, uh, can I take on the, just one? Well, I think let's bring in uh, sure. Anna Marie first. First of all, I wanted to ask you this question, perhaps about farmers. Oddly, is quite a good question for you because you're working in all communities around the world. You're not just working in, you know, you're not just working in metropolitan United States. Uh, are some of the cities you're involved in less developed cities, cities where some of these questions would appear? Sure. Um, I think farmers and also communities or countries where they have very high and rich natural resources and those are really exploited and they don't get to benefit from um, those natural resources I think is one of the questions in Africa and Latin America and even in the US where Native Americans have um, a lot of natural riches in mining and coal but don't get to take advantage. Um, often um, there's artisans and um, the farmers, what we're trying to do, and it's not my space but I can connect you to the people that are doing that particular work, is developing the delivery systems so that they'll be um, much more robust and much uh, much better, and also the value chains I think are important, and who's benefiting from these goods, and how do you make sure that the value um, and the ones who are benefiting are those that are, at least it's spread out more equally. Let's just use Skype, and uh, because we do have somebody who knows quite a lot about African cities, and that's Belelwa. If we could just uh, bring her back, hopefully, into the conversation. Is she there? Let's give it one more second. We'll return to Balawa. I think she may have gone to make a cup of tea. But I we'll said something about that. Yeah. <laughs> I think the most important um, uh, answer on that is a new question. Why are these farmers moving towards cities knowing that they will live in very bad circumstances? Ask the people of Casablanca, and they will tell you about thousands and ten thousands of people last decades moves from the rural areas to Casablanca. That's why the city don't have exact statistics. All these people never register. But the question is, why did they move to Casablanca? And the, the, the answer is really easy, because they had no space to make a living in those rural areas. And that's the big question. Uh, I was visiting Mumbai two years ago, and my colleague over there told me that 80%, 8-0, of all passengers that came Mumbai in by train, never leave Mumbai. They stay. They come to stay. So they sleep everywhere. Well, if somebody from you had been walking down Mumbai, they sleep really everywhere. Mm -hmm. And even that, to their circumstance, is better than where they came from. And that's, I think, the big issue that we have to tackle, how to keep these wonderful people farming the way the parents did by providing good circumstances. Sanitation, water electricity, uh, health care, and education for the children. And what I think what we did not succeed in doing that, and I have been living in the village uh, before leaving Morocco until um, the age of 15. Still, there is no road to that mountain where I have been um, living. I have been walking seven hours in the morning, seven kilometers down the hill to go to school, and seven kilometers going up the hill at the end of the day. Wow. And if, if, if it was rain, mud until here. So the circumstances were not that good. <laughs> Fortunately, I became mayor, and, this, um, and a friend of mine became even a, a doctor from that little school over there. But the circumstances in those villages are not suitable to stay there. And I think that's the issue we have to tackle, not the fact that they are in the cities. I'm going to uh, just very quickly, because uh, there's so many more people with arms uh, One of dying the problems to pop up. is that we have rural and we have urban, and the people who are looking at these economies are like, almost even pitting them against each other. And we don't have planners and people that are thinking about the regions. And you need to think about the interdependence and how they work together. And I think that that is, uh, when, where you see regions that are doing this, they can take advantage. Let's take one more question. And the, the lady here with the, already has the microphone ready. Could you just say where you're from, please? I've also got three questions. No, I think and we have we to we should do one. whittle it down. Let's do, let's do one, please. 
three very quick ones. First of all, to Anna Maria. <laughs> Sorry about this. I'm Pro Sylvia Chant, Professor of Development Geography at the LSE and Director of the MSc in Urbanisation and Development. I was very intrigued by what Anna Maria said about um, uh, Cali being an experiment, because we know that Colombia is a country replete with visionary mayors. We think about Peñalosa and Antanas Mocas in Bogotá, and we think about Sergio Fajardo in Medellín. And I just wonder to what extent you were actually using local practice to inform your interventions. A second issue, very, very quickly, is that we know that cities are great generators of wealth and they can be ge great generators of inclusion. Uh, however, all the UN habitat evidence, uh, as robust as it might or might not be, suggests that as cities grow and as they create greater shares of GDP, um, uh, basically inequality is growing, as measured by Gini coefficient, as measured by the um, City Prosperity Index. Um, so what can we do to try and stop that inequality growing? And I think the third question is, we've talked about inclusion, and we've talked about it particularly in relation to global cities with large um, populations of ethnic and migrant minorities. What about gender? Is there something we also need to do to make uh, cities more inclusive for gender? Well, we've Thank got you a very smorgasbord much. of questions there. And Anna-Marie, would you like to pick up the question that was directed to yourself? Sure, real quickly. Um, in Cali, we were called by the mayor. Um, we didn't just sort of plop down and uh, work there. And everything we're doing is with local folks. We don't even, we don't have staff there, um, but it, we are trying to um, work with them to leave behind capacity and to, depending on the tools and the kind of thinking that they, that they need, we're trying to bring those kind of resources um, in terms of inequality, that's so true, and that's one of the things that's keeping us at night is that even though there's economic growth in the world, uh, inequality is growing, and so who benefits um, from the urbanization is something that, uh, as UN Habitat is, is explaining, is, is very critical. Antonio, the questions around the growing divide. It seems to be in every single city this question is coming up again and again. But certainly in every European city there feels to be a, a pull away. Uh, why do you think that is? Well, first of all, I mean the notion that that's peculiar to cities is mm. uh, doesn't uh, bear out in the facts. The reason why people leave those rural areas is because of destitute poverty. And so they come to cities uh, where they're is great poverty and also great wealth. And yes, it is a challenge for cities uh, and national governments, but particularly cities, because we're on the front line, uh, as Mayor Ahmed said so uh, eloquently, uh, it is critical for us to be looking at that issue. And that means, as I said earlier, uh, focusing on things like affordable housing and transportation that is accessible to the poor, particularly education and job skills. And job skills, not just for the old economy, but job skills that we know will be in the new economy. And uh, there are other things that I would mention, but I'm trying to keep it as brief as possible. <laughs> uh, and I would say it would be helpful, honestly. I think my colleague uh, said it, uh, Nelson Cunningham said it uh, earlier today, I think, when he said, I'll answer 27% of that question. When you have multiple questions, at, it's hard. It would yeah. be a lot easier if you just asked one. But Lawa, we're going to pull you in here. We're talking about the growing divide in our cities. Cape Town, again, is an extraordinary city. In, uh, it has this very unusual fact that it was divided and designed to be divided along race lines. And those lines, in many ways, are still stuck in the city today. Is that a, an impediment that is going to be there for generations? How are you trying to bridge the gaps that were put in by the apartheid regime? Um, yes, I mean, the, 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 the city of Cape Town, of course, like all South African cities, was designed for separation. It is, as you said, still divided along race, race line, you agree, uh, racial groups. What we really do as a Cape Town partnership, we find that it's very important to have a storytelling narrative that allows the citizens to participate in a conversation that seeks to be able to show them what brings them together than what separates them. So, for example, as a Cape Town partnership, yes. we have a project which we call a Molo, which is a publication of, uh, which is produced by the Cape Town partnership, but it's a storytelling narrative of Cape Townians who talk about their love of the city from their perspective as Cape Townians, 
amongst all sorts of other uh, uh, divisions. So for example, you can have a very, very benign topic such as food. So if you have multi-generations of uh, black colors and white talking about food recipes in their own communities, sharing that with, the, with their love of Cape Town, we find that that actually works a lot. Because what happens in a space where there's a lot of dialogue and a lot of competition, you find that there's always a thing that comes to a, to a, to a sticky point to says, who is Cape Townian? When we have so many people that have moved into this city, again, there are people who've been here forever. However, they still live so far away from places of opportunity. You need to find a way of bringing all of that together. So in, the, in order to create social cohesion, there's no other shortcut. You need to be able to get to the emotion. And through the soul of this, you are able to put that uh, narrative together. So that's what we do. And there was a notion also that the point around food, uh, around urban, uh, sorry, agriculture. One of the issues that we're pushing very hard as Cape Town Partnership is the notion of uh, food security through urban agriculture, which means if you come to this city, you are able to learn to be a farmer, that you can then go back and, play and, play and, and implement those lessons in the rural areas. Thank you, Bilawa. Now, we're quickly going to fit in a... Actually, there's a question. The, the issue of this gender, is, gender equality is still not answered. Yes, we'll, we'll come back to that. There's like 10 minutes left. There's a question to be fitted in, and we'll come back to that after. So quickly, if we could potentially pull out the question, you get your Spot Me app out. We're going to ask a question that everybody has an ability to vote on. And this question is about the players we have here on the stage. It's about who is the best person or the best organisation to get things done when we're talking about inclusion. You know, and let's, hit, let's pop the question up. So here we go. Which of these sectors should take the lead on improving sustainability and inequality in cities? The private sector, local government, national government, NGOs, or the philanthropists who have a nice bank account? <laughs> so let's get voting. Yeah. All of them together. <sighs> Local government. So that's a, a big endorsement for your stuff. Now, I know you wanted to jump in. We were talking about inclusion, and there's all sorts of versions of inclusion. One of these is on the, the gender question. Yeah. Well, talking about um, the roles of national governments and local governments, it was our colleague, uh, David Miller, uh, yes. former mayor of Toronto, a great man, who um, during um, a shadow conference in Copenhagen, um, a shadow conference for the uh, sustainability um, top, that world leaders are talking and mayors act. And I think that's what makes that visible. And the, the issue of gender equality, it was, uh, I think, uh, the uh, king of Morocco, Mohammed VI, who uh, said in his uh, very remarkable speech a, a, a number of years ago, um, in an attempt to change the uh, family law in, in Morocco, saying that uh, a country that is not treating um, both genders equally will lay behind. Mm -hmm. And that is the truth. Right. And I have always aiming for that statement. It was encouraging to me, but there is a difference between the letter of the law and the practice. So there is really a, um, a big distance to go to, to do that. And we expect a lot from women especially in this part of the world, uh, especially as mother. But there is an Arabic saying that says, If you don't have something, you can't give anything away. So if we expect so much from these mothers and these women, and we don't invest in them, and we don't treat them equally, then it's not a very um, big surprise that maybe they have nothing to deliver. I know there's a sense of frustration. There's so many more questions. It would be great to take but I know that people would also like to get out <laughs> and have a drink as well. We have five minutes left, and I thought that I'd allow the panel to touch on this quickly on this question of sustainability and inclusion, just to give us their summary, their kind of key point that they think we should all be addressing. Perhaps from a, a Los Angeles perspective, what would, you, what would be your key message that people in this room should take away? Well, first of all, I also want to address the issue of gender uh, equity. Uh, for the 20 years I was Speaker of the Assembly, Mayor, and Assembly Member, the vast majority of that time, my Chief of Staff was women, more than 50% of my senior leaders were women, All my, more than 50% of my commissioners, and it wasn't just a goal to, for equity sakes, it's because they were the most talented people in the room. 
Uh, so I, I do think that that's an important issue, and I agree with the mayor uh, that the key to great societies is how we include all of us, but particularly women. You know, I, I would say the issue, uh, I'm going to hit on the same issue that mayor mentioned a few minutes ago. When we were in Copenhagen, the national leaders were all elbowing each other to see who could get out of the room faster, pointing fingers at one another, blaming each other on the state of the world today in terms of climate change, we were holding hands with one another, working together, adopting each other's best practices. In the United States, although the United States government never signed on to Kyoto, 1,300 cities did. LA is number one in the last eight years in reduction in carbon emissions, 28%. I believe that Ber uh, Copenhagen and Berlin are at 40, uh, uh, the uh, Toronto at 34. Uh, we were focused on many of the global issues acting locally, and I think that also uh, affirms what uh, the mayor mentioned a few minutes ago. Well, uh, well, let's quickly call you back in from uh, Cape Town. Give us your takeaway, the thing that you would like the audience to think about when they leave tonight, and I'm sorry you're not going to be at dinner with us. It's going to be good, though. <laughs> I'm sure it will be. Yeah. Um, uh, really, my one summation would be we need stronger partnership for stronger inclusive economic growth. And through that, we're able to narrow the gap and be able to have a, 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 an active and participating citizenry. Anna-Marie, the woman who sits in the Ford Foundation, who's I, done every kind of role, what, what would be your takeaway for everybody here today? I would piggyback on what she's saying. I think these are uh, the inequality and the inclusive and, and the sustainability. These are everything and everyone challenges. I was not so pleased that people are thinking it's just the cities. I think the cities also need the national government. For example, in transportation, those dollars come from the national government. Is it not, do you see many not places? Not anymore. Yeah. Uh, not lately. <laughs> That's but just it, not true in the United in, States. In the U.S., but in many other countries, yes. So they should come from yeah, the national yeah, government. Yeah. You're right. And they put the transport then in the roads where they think there's bottlenecks and where they just make roads wider, not where the jobs are, not where the houses are. So this linking... Uh, and your mom, you know, having to ride the bus, this linking of houses and jobs and transport, that really has to come from the people, um, where you see that the people have a cho uh, input into the participation and into the process, there it goes much better. And so I would just look at this table and making the table, setting the table in a different way. And finally, Mayor Apitola. Well, as um, uh, cities and communities are may made and constructed by people, to me is human capital the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I put my first three dollars, the first one will be in, um, help me, education, the second dollar will be in <laughs> education, <laughs> and the third dollar will be education, no surprise. Thank I'm, you. I'm right there. <laughs> Um, I'd like to thank an incredible panel who've been honest and given us concrete examples, told us about their lives, and hopefully set some inspiration going as well. They're going to be around, of course, for the whole weekend, and I'm sure they'll be delighted to tell you more about the work they've done. Many, many other things, unfortunately, we weren't able to bring up tonight, but a big round of applause for an amazing panel. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing model. <laughs> And Andrew, our thanks to you for what has really been a terrific conversation, and thanks to all of you again, uh, and a terrific contribution to our debate. We're going to have a 30-minute coffee break, and after that, we're going to reconvene here for a conversation with the former Prime Minister of Senegal. So thank you very much. Enjoy the coffee break. <laughs>